I just came back from Santiago, Chile. And I can tell you about my stories there. So, um, I'll tell you about Chile. So, Santiago is an impressive city. And the landscape is beautiful. <laughs> um, so, last Thursday we opened, ISGAP opened a program with the University of Chile. Um, so, we had our first meetings and we signed uh, agreements with the university. The Canadian ambassador was there. And the Can Canadian government actually sent me about a year ago to, to Chile and, so, and to Argentina. There's a special program that they have promoting uh, democratic principles and citizenship. And they asked me to participate in, a, in the program. And I spoke to a joint session of the, of the Chilean uh, Congress and Senate about a year ago. And then I went on to Chile uh, to speak at a university and the the uh, community center, this was the same community center that was destroyed um, in uh, 1983, I think. I don't remember the date when the Iranians blew up the um, Jewish community center in Buenos Aires. And they rebuilt it, I spoke there. And it was to make a long story short, um, the Canadian government, the ambassador was present at our first um, inaugural event and the University of Chile, and they've been very supportive of the work of ISGAP, which is uh, wonderful. And then I participated in a special program that was uh, put on by the World Jewish Congress and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Israel, where um, about 50 to 60 young leaders, young Jewish leaders from around South America attended. There were young people from about 10, from actually from 10 South American uh, Jewish communities. And we all met in uh, Santiago for a three-day conference on young Jewish leadership. And it was uh, fascinating. So I gave, my, I gave a talk or a workshop on anti-Semitism, global anti-Semitism. But I had the chance to sort of interact in a very intensive uh, three days of meetings from 9 in the morning till 1 or 2 in the morning. Wow. Uh, so we had dinners. We went out to uh, restaurants together. It was very intense. And... Um, it, it's uh, it's fascinating, and and it was sort of uh, I would say, an awakening, or it, it woke me up. And we often say that uh, New York City is a bit of a bubble, and the liberal Jewish community is a bit of a bubble in New York. And it was interesting to realize that I think maybe I also got caught up in the bubble, that the issues of global anti-Semitism. Are, are happening in the United States. We know they're happening on campuses. Uh, Barry Cosman wrote a very important study that was published a few weeks ago. He's a professor from Hartford, Connecticut, and he showed in his, in his analysis that over 54%, um, 54% 54 of uh, American Jewish students on, um, in, in American universities on campuses experienced firsthand, experienced or witnessed firsthand uh, an act of anti-Semitism in the past year. So it's 54 percent, which is extraordinary. It's, you, you know, so even, you know, me and my colleagues who are involved in the study of anti-Semitism and we're doing this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I was even surprised. And it's a serious study. The methodology is serious. So we know this and we, we hear from, uh, from students what's going on on campus. We also hear from scholars what's going on and we hear these stories. But global anti-Semitism in Europe and, in, and now in South America is really becoming more and more significant. So I was there about 18 months ago on this Canadian-sponsored uh, program, and I haven't been back for, for 18 months, and there's really a shift. During the Gaza War in, uh, in Santiago, it's a Jewish community of about 15,000 people, mostly of Polish or origin, third, fourth generation uh, Jewish, Chilean. Um, in, in Santiago, there's between four to 600,000 people of Palestinian origin who are mostly Christian, but for reasons which I don't quite understand, they seem to be very supportive of Hamas. So during the Gaza war, there was, uh, you know, on, on university campuses, a lot of protesting. There were acts of violence. Actually, some people's homes were invaded and people were beaten up in their homes. So things 
um, became serious from the Gaza war onwards. And I think the community, th they're a successful community, they're well integrated. Um, but I think there's grave, I would say grave concern that something um, could sort of erupt almost at a moment's notice. There's, there's, um, there, there's grave concern, I'll put it that way. There isn't, you know, a few years ago some of us were, we would speak about global anti-Semitism and the community, some people were um, concerned, some people were interested, some people dismissed it. But this is a community where the threat level is significant. Um, and then I met leaders, young Jewish leaders, these were people between 25 and 40 years old from Argentina. Argentina has a large Jewish community, especially in Buenos Aires. I believe there's about 230,000 Jews in Buenos Aires alone. And also, do you know the story of Alberto Nisman? So, for those who don't know, Alberto, Alberto Nisman, who was uh, who spoke at ISGAP events at Yale and was a, uh, I'd say, a colleague and uh, a friend within the milieu of people fighting anti-Semitism. Uh, we were in Geneva together. He came to Yale at our invitation. I met him at different conferences around the world. And the the evening or the night or the morning before he was going to testify about the role of the Argentinian government in covering up the, the uh, blowing up and the murder of people in the, in the Jewish community, in the, the, the destroying the Jewish community center. Uh, the night before he was supposed to present his prosecution against the government for covering up uh, this scandal, uh, he, was, he was murdered. The government immediately claimed that he committed suicide. And um, um, it's just so far-fetched that uh, he commits, committed suicide. So he's become a symbol of government uh, corruption and sort of the times harking back to a period of violence and extremism in Argentina. And he, who is a Jewish, uh, leading Jewish figure, has sort of become the lightning rod of all the uh, issues in Argentinian society, from the right, from the left, um, some of the anti-Semites are becoming more active. There's been increased uh, uh, indications of anti-Semitism, of desecrations, of graffiti. And the Jewish community, I think, from what I understand, and I'm not an expert in Argentinian uh, politics or society or the Jewish community by any means, but it's a community that is uh, also um, uh, gravely concerned about the situation. So. And there's, um, you know, there's a history of, of violence in the political culture in Argentina. And I think people in general are worried about the level of violence that could potentially happen in general, given the scandals and the corruption and the politics. Um, but there's also, I think, a heightened awareness in the Jewish community of, uh, of what may lie ahead. And then, you know, you sort of hear from smaller communities, from Uruguay, from Paraguay, from Peru, um, from Central America, Costa Rica, Panama, um, where I think global anti-Semitism, I, I think Argentina and Chile may be the two uh, hot issues, but there's um, a general concern about the perception of Jews in South America by the community. The situation in Venezuela is also, um, you know, it, it, it's calm. Uh, there were several people from Venezuela who were there, but this is a community that uh, about 10 years ago had, I think, about 30,000 people, and they're down to about 5,000 people, um, where, you know, there's different kinds of anti-Semitism, I guess, in the world. There's different, we, we, we say there's anti-Semitisms, there's kind of religious bigotry, there could be racist anti-Semitism. There's the demonization of uh, Israel and Jewish peoplehood. And I think, in a sense, many of the Venezuelans would say that Venezuela is not a traditionally anti-Semitic country, which I found interesting because it was a heavily, heavily Catholic uh, society. And coming from Quebec, I originally come from Quebec, and I know living in a Catholic society, there's all sorts of... Uh, tropes and histories, so, but they were adamant in saying that Venezuela was very much open to immigration and it's, it's not an anti-Semitic country, but just more recently under Chavez and the current uh, communist regime, 
that there's um, sort of an anti-Semitism which is focused more on issues of Israel and Zionism and they sort of feel it but it's they everybody was saying it's more political and it's not deep in the society which I found interesting and um, surprising because from from the outside given the legacy of, of, of the church plus this contemporary sort of communist anti-Zionist anti-imperialist uh, Worldview, you would imagine that it was more that the anti-Semitism is deeper, but people from from Venezuela who know uh, claim that it's not, and that in fact um, that there's interest. There was a lot of interest throughout South America when we opened the program the day the day before this uh, conference. There's a lot of interest in South America for ISGAP to create programs potentially throughout Latin America. So we, we're hoping. Uh, to, to, to do more programming at good universities there. So it was uh, fascinating. So we were, we're living in a time where I think young leaders are coming of an age where perhaps for the first time in several generations they have to confront very serious issues, that these are not abstract issues, this is not just an academic issue where we discuss theory and philosophy or the histories of some community in some medieval moment in time where we get to, you know, dissect a moment in the past, that this is happening in real time. And uh, many communities in South America and we know in Europe are trying to grapple with this emerging crisis. And one of the things I, I don't no, I don't know if I've ever done it, but I actually wrote a, a letter to Ron Lauder, Ambassador Lauder, and Betty Arenberg of the World Jewish Congress last week, because I think Ambassador Lauder, on behalf of the World Jewish Congress, I think was the first uh, serious, mainstream Jewish leader who testified in, con in Congress uh, in front of a hearing, a subcommittee hearing on anti-Semitism, and he said very clearly that the United States of America is not leading on the fight of anti-Semitism and that their absence is causing problems and that the Americans have to step up and become a leader once again and I, I wrote him a letter of thanks and I hope that his words are the words that are going to break the dam of our silence in our community and the silence in the human rights community that that and I, I thank the World Jewish Congress for taking an unequivocal, clear stand. Not hysterical, not right-wing, just a serious statement that the United States must be once again the leader on human rights and the leader on the fight against um, bigotry, and including anti-Semitism. And for decades, the United States was a leader, if not the leader, when it came to human rights and standing up for democratic principles. But when it's come to these issues of contemporary anti-Semitism in the last few years, I think it would be suffice to say that they have not been leading. And I commend the World Jewish Congress for taking a, a, a principled, sound position and ringing the, the alarm bell loudly. And I think that it resonates when, when you hear Ambassador Lauder say these words that the United States has to lead and you meet people in European diaspora communities and you meet people from throughout South America, there's this vacuum that the, the, the silence of the United States of America on these issues really has an impact. And we don't perhaps feel it as much here because the United States for all sorts of re reasons I think is different, it evolved differently. I think um, it's a country of migration and immigration and freedom and liberty and people don't want big government and people for all sorts of reasons have been tolerant. Um, when it comes to human rights and overcoming issues of racism and gendered inequality. Um, and I think that, you know, there's more leeway here, potentially, uh, to be open. But when the government of the United States is largely silent, and some critics, including myself, will say that I've actually, through their policy of engaging radical Islamists like the Muslim Brotherhood and like the Iranian revolutionary regime and remaining silent on anti-Semitism, that it's having an impact globally. It's really having, it's empowering the bad people. And when you meet young people from communities that are not as protected and don't live in societies which as much freedoms that are guaranteed as here in the United States, 
you really, it, it drives home the fact that we're living in a moment globally where if left unchecked, anti-Semitism is not just a threat to the Jewish communities, but it's a threat to democratic principles and economic and political and social stability uh, throughout the world. And so, you know, coming back, I think those of us who are dealing with anti-Semitism, ISGAP in the academy and other organizations throughout the world who care about anti-Semitism and care about human rights and the rights of minorities, our voices need to be heard loud and clear from our community to policymakers, to intellectuals, to the media. And I think that this is, uh, these times are very serious internationally. So if I'm going to bring home one message from my uh, very, very special trip to South America, this is it, that we really, that this is not just an American issue. We're all interconnected now. It's an international issue. It's a global issue. And what happens here is really felt throughout the world. And there are communities that are not as protected and not as living in stable societies as we do. And these reverberations of radical political Islam and the silence of people in the democratic center really has implications. And um, hopefully, as soon as possible, those of us who care about human rights, those of us who care about liberal democratic values, that we make our voices heard here and we allow our voices to be heard internationally. That these are very serious times. So I'd be happy to have, I don't know, conversation, questions. Just last, oh, can you pull sure. Just last night I was reading the Jewish Sentinel, and it said it really was great the way in, I think it was in the University of Oklahoma, when uh, fraternity, um, the racist fraternity, black stuff, mm -hmm. and how they were shut down and immediate action was yeah. taken. Why not when it happens to the Jewish kids on campus? All right. So that's a great so question. So the question was, to repeat, is um, the Jewish Sentinel had an article about how this uh, racist fraternity at Oklahoma University, they were singing these uh, horribly disgusting racist songs, um, that as soon as people found out about it, there was a very strong reaction to confront the racism and to let everybody know that there's no space at a place like uh, Oklahoma University for racists. And why, when it comes to anti-Semitism, there's such a silence? And that's a great question. I was just having a conversation about this today. And um, Dan Hayuni, who's a professor of art and theater uh, in New York at CUNY and who's a fellow at ISGAP, um, he wrote a letter to the New Yorker magazine last week had an anti-Israel article. And it also had another article in the same edition which compared Jews to dogs. Uh, right? So, well, it was with humor, apparently. But many people were offended. And Dan Hayoni wrote to the editor saying how um, that he will not tolerate this form of behavior anymore and this anti Semitism. And he wrote a very eloquent letter which I, I can't repeat, but we should, share, we should share it, we should circulate it. And he said, could you imagine if the New Yorker compared Muslims to dogs or African American to dogs or women to dogs or gay people to dogs, there'd be outrage. And when it comes to degrading or denigrating Jews and Israel and Jewish peoplehood, there is a silence. And I think Dan Hayoni, who's a professor, is right on. And I don't think we should be tolerant of non-tolerance. Did they publish his uh, letter? I don't know. I don't know. Somebody said to me, that's because nobody's afraid of the Jews. They're not a violent uh, yeah. people. Well, actually, Dan Hayoni said that um, if they would have made the comparison to some groups, the editor would have been shot in the face. Oh. But when it comes to Jews, he said three or four people may write a letter. <laughs> Ira Foreman, who is in the State Department, whose role is anti-Semitism. What is your feelings uh, on how he's doing so far? So the question is, Ira Foreman, who's the, he has an ambassador status uh, in the State Department, and he's the ambassador on issues of anti-Semitism, uh, appointed by President Obama. 
His predecessor was Hannah Rosenthal, who was also uh, appointed by President Obama in the first term. And it was actually President Bush who started this post. Who, uh, Greg Rickman was the first ambassador um, in the State Department on anti-Semitism. Um, so what is my opinion of, of the work of this ambassador, or Mr. Foreman, Ambassador Foreman in particular? So I would say, again, I think his work is uh, important, and I'm sure it's not easy. Um, I've met him a few times. He's a mensch. He's a good guy. He, he cares deeply about these issues, from what I see. Um, but I happen to agree deeply with Ambassador Lauder that the United States must speak out very clear and very loud on these issues. And I think Ambassador Lauder said what was obvious to many people when the attacks happened in Paris and um, the Attorney General Holder was in Paris on the morning of the demonstration in which more than a million people came together and every leader of the world, almost every country of the democratic world and beyond was represented, yes, there was not representation from the American government, from the, from the US government. And I think that was, um, it's a travesty. And I also know for a fact that even the ambassador of the United States to France was also uh, disturbed by the lack of uh, participation of leadership from the government. So, um, so I agree with, with Ambassador Lauder that the United States has to take a, a strong role. And um, you know, I, I just remember watching the news on Friday, the, 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 day, the, the week of the attack, several days after the attack, and um, I was about to fall asleep and I saw James Taylor and, and uh, Secretary of State Kerry singing in French, You've Got a Friend. And I woke up the next day and I spoke to my friend and you know in my family, if you have a dream on Shabbat, it's a, it's a very important dream. Mm -hmm. So I called my friend and I said, was I dreaming or did I really see that on the news last night? But that is not an appropriate response to what happened in Paris. And I'd also like to say that President Obama's statement about a, a random act at, a, at some deli was obscene. And the fact that I don't know if he ever walked back that horrific mistake, the fact that we don't know if he ever walked back that horrific mistake is a travesty. Because we know, and we know, we know. This is not conjecture, this is not projection, we know that a core element of the jihadist Islamist movement uses genocidal anti-Semitism as a core element of its ideological attempt to persuade people of their worldview and to impose a caliphate on the Islamic world, if not beyond. We know this. We know that the killer, Koulibaly, in the Delhi, asked each and every person before they were executed if they were Jewish. And this was hours before Shabbos at a kosher deli. And for people in leadership positions not to recognize this in 2015 is a problem. It's a serious problem. We have to call out contemporary anti-Semitism for what it is. And the Islamists, I, I wrote in one, one piece that, uh, that I did not too long ago, but if, the, if, we're re, if we're remaining silent in the West on this Islamist, not Islam, not Muslims, but Islamist anti-Semitism, we are, in a sense, allowing these barbaric thugs to become the shock troops for the anti-Semites in the West. Our silence is empowering these shock troops. We must speak out because while we know, while they talk about the Jews and Israel and the Zionists, they're killing gay people, they're killing Christians, they're killing Yazdis, they're, they're subjugating women. Girls who want to become literate are, are becoming the enemy of this reactionary social movement, are being killed in their schools for wanting to learn to read. And if we are liberals, and if we believe in equality under one legal system, if we believe that women have the right to read, if we believe that women are not the property of the men of their family, basic, good, civil right, liberal values, then our, what, what, what have we come to? So this is not just a Jewish problem. This is a problem of people who care about protecting 
and promoting democratic values. <laughs> Very good. All right. So now the whiskey is in the back. No, I'm kidding. There's coffee. <laughs> Does anybody have other questions or comments? So what do we do? So is we? Well, we the Jews, we who or others who care about democratic principles and citizenship. So in our small little way, we're trying to put a a drop of water in the bucket of decency and try to take back the universities and try to map and decode anti-Semitism. But this is a tiny drop in the bucket and this will take generations to do. Um, I was speaking to some people today and we were talking about the student struggle for Soviet Jewry and the anti-apartheid movement. And I think this is what we need to do. What we need to do, in my humble opinion, I remember when I was a kid uh, marching at the, at the Soviet consulate in Montreal with my sister and all of her friends, with all of my friends, with my parents and all of their friends, with my grandparents and all of their friends. Wow. In the heat of the summer and in February, in minus God knows what degrees, we were marching. All of us, the Jewish community and others who cared about human rights in the Soviet Union, and we were screaming, let my people go. And this was a movement started by um, housewives in those days and kids. And they pushed the Jewish community, they propelled the Jewish community to do something. And they made a difference. And the anti-apartheid movement was also started by young people. The ANC Youth League and students all over the Western world pushed um, their communities to defeat apartheid South Africa. And what we were saying is, could you imagine on a nice spring Sunday if the Jewish community, high school students, university students, the parents of students who are paying sixty and seventy thousand dollars a year to, to universities that are teaching their children to hate Jewish peoplehood and the grandparents had a peaceful march through the campus of Columbia University saying we won't tolerate this anymore and, and having informed speakers, not rabble-rousers, not extremists, but serious leaders of our community saying no we want a proper education for our students and we won't tolerate this. And I, and I think you're right. There's no other people that would tolerate this. Could you imagine if there were courses, core courses at the best universities that were teaching racism or teaching sexism or teaching homophobia in 2015? There would be a serious, rea and a serious reaction and there ought to be a serious reaction. But we accept the best universities in our country teaching another generation of kind of postmodern, postcolonial attacks against the very notion of Jewish peoplehood. So could you imagine if there was a peaceful, peaceful protest with three generations marching through the best campuses in, in the country and maybe aligning ourselves with women's groups and gay groups and uh, religious minority groups? Imagine, I don't know, that may have an impact. Maybe it will create a spark. And maybe at UCLA, the demonization of Israel and Jewish peoplehood gets to the point where a student council can actually openly try to uh, forbid a, a young, intelligent Jewish student not to be a member of the student government because her Judaism is a bias to being a member of a, it's unbelievable. And this is UCLA in 2015. It's not the Ukraine in 1940-whatever. Yeah. You know, and th this was in the, the Times for one day, and, and that's the end of it. Right. Well, whose fault is this? I think it's our Why fault. Why are we all screaming about we are, it? I think it's our fault. It and imagine if a peaceful march through UCLA's beautiful campus of, of high school students that are going to be the future students, and young Jewish students who are there as students now, and graduates and alumni and the parents who are paying the tuition and the grandparents, that would, I think that would be wonderful. The Soviet Union was a common enemy of the American people. As opposed to here, when you take your march, you'll have a, it won't be a peaceful march. It'll be 
a, a much, a much bigger going against your march. So it's not just unfortunately it's not comparable. Well, you know, I don't know if there would be a bigger march. We don't know. We don't know that for sure. But I agree with you that the challenge, it's easy for us here to complain about problems way over there. But the anti-apartheid movement is easy for people in Canada and the United States because it's not in our backyard. It's far away. And maybe it was easier for us to condemn the, the evils of the Soviet Union because it was anti-democratic and it was, you know, at war basically against the West and the United States. So for American human rights activists and American Jews to condemn that at some level, it was relatively easy compared to fighting and combating anti-Semitism in our own society, in, in our own universities, in our own media of record, and among our own policymakers. It's a great challenge, but I think that we can learn from Jewish history and we can learn from the history of the United States that when people peacefully protest against injustice, there's a great legacy in this country of being fair. And why won't people be fair to, to fighting anti-Semitism? I think that we should uh, not assume the worst, and I think we can assume the best of this country as a response. You, you, we see it everywhere. We see it with, um, with gay rights, with women rights, with uh, the civil rights. There are, there's legacy of negativity in this country, but there's also an amazing legacy of uh, people expanding their minds and welcoming people into the body politic and into citizenship in this country. So I'm not, I'm not so sure that we have to be afraid. If we're afraid, we're going to lose. And I don't think we have anything to be afraid, and we are in a great democracy. We're not in a country, we're not in a country like Argentina or Chile, where there is a a legacy of, of brutality and political assassinations and people disappearing. We don't have that legacy here, thank God. So I don't think we have to worry that in that way. And we, I, think we, if, I think people respect people who are stand up for the principles. And it's not just a Jewish problem, it's a, it's a, wider, it's a wider issue. Their bonds were downgraded from double B to single B, which I put two and two together, and I say, well, maybe some people. Whose bonds? The Metropolitan Opera has bonds. Interesting. Bonds, oh, and their bonds were downgraded. Number one, number two, in the um, Jewish Sentinel, they said that these Jewish kids, and a lot of them are starting, you know, the Open Hill L, and starting to side with the other side. They've had it very good. They've never experienced real hardship, and they need a purpose in life. Like in the 60s, marching for civil rights, this is their purpose, the poor Palestinians, because honestly, they've had it too good. Yeah. This is their, what they said, and I think it's in part true. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. <clears throat> is it realistic, though, to um, <clears throat> think that a small people like the Jews, and you should expect fairness. After all, the United States bombed Serbia, but didn't bomb Russia. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, we, to say that, for example, um, <clears throat> South Africa was once allied to Israel. So did, the, did Israel gain anything by uh, fighting apartheid? I don't know if Israel did fight apartheid. Well, well, uh, yeah. Did we gain anything by doing that? Did we, as, a, as, yeah, the, as, as, a, as, as, as Jews? Did we as Jews gain anything by fighting apartheid? Yes, I think so. I, I think that we, well, <laughs> there were many Jewish people in the anti-apartheid movement who were in South Africa and outside of South Africa. And yes, I would argue that defeating a regime that can trace its ideological origins to Nazi Nazism and National Socialism uh, and, uh, is, a great, is a great step forward for humanity. And um, I, I was very active in the anti-apartheid movement, actually. So I come from this uh, world view. And I remember the, um, the Canadian government sent me, as the, the Canadian government was at the forefront, eventually became at the forefront of the anti-apartheid movement. And the, um, the Minister of Labor with the ANC chose people to go as the first, um, to the first legal 
congresses of the unbanned parties as international observers, and I and I was chosen to go, and I was act I was the chairperson of the ANC Solidarity Committee of Canada, and they sent me, and um, so I think to be involved in this movement was a special thing, and I remember I flew to South Africa via Amsterdam, and this was um, in the early 19, I think it was 1991, 90 or 91, 91 I believe, and this is when I think the European Union was sort of picking up strength, and I remember listening as we landed in Amsterdam for the first time in my life to announcements in many languages, Dutch and French and English and German, and I remember looking out the window, I'll never forget this moment in my life, and I remember listening to the German announcement, and I was thinking, how fortunate I am. Because if the Nazis, if this um, National Socialism triumphed in the world, I would never be a middle-class Canadian Jewish kid flying to fight apartheid. I wouldn't probably have existed, because my ancestors would have been eliminated. Um, and I remember at that instant, I, I felt very... It was a profound personal moment because I thought like, wow, here I am in 1991, I'm alive, I have my culture intact, and I'm going to fight the remnants of this inhumane uh, regime that degrades human beings, created in the image of God, into substandard, subhuman categories. And I thought, what a privilege that I am alive and I'm able to fight this racist, Nazi-like regime. And yes, I think to, def to defeat racism and to promote democratic principles and equality is a wonderful thing. And if anti-Semitism now exists in our midst, I think it's incumbent upon us to do something about it. And the lessons, I think, of the anti-apartheid movement was that it attracted all sorts of people from all over the world. And I, I really believe, given the legacy of anti-Semitism in the Western world, that there, there are people with goodwill. There are many people with goodwill. And I think that uh, we should continue the struggle for human rights and citizenship and human decency and to eliminate all forms of discrimination as best as we can. And the thing about democracy, unlike Judaism, is you don't inherit it. Every generation has to defend it. Every generation has to protect it and make it move further. That's my response. <laughs> what if the majority hate Jews? If the majority hate Jews, well, I think it was Martin Luther King who said that, um, I don't remember the exact quote, but some people were, were critical of him because people like uh, Stokely Carmichael there was a, and uh, Malcolm X were critical that Martin Luther King was really, it was about including African Americans into the, to become citizens of the larger society, to integrate and not to have discrimination um, against them in all facets of life. And some people were saying that the civil rights movement was really not going to be effective. And I remember Martin Luther King had this amazing quote, I'm not going to be as eloquent, and he, but he said something to the effect that if, if people hate me, that's bad. But if they are legally obligated not to lynch me, that's good, right? So at least the law was going to defend African Americans as citizens and lynching would be punished. So they still may hate them, which is a bad thing, but the laws were going to protect them. So I think laws protect us and laws uh, defend the principles of democratic America. And then uh, we, we have to push the laws and the infrastructure which protects all citizens Civil rights legislation also protects Jews, and they protect them at universities that are, are subsidized uh, legal entities that receive state funding, government funding. And to receive government funding in this country, you cannot discriminate. So if Middle East Studies departments and other departments are discriminating against Jews or people of certain national origin, that's against the law in this country, right? And there are people working to use the protections of this great democracy to defend all people, including Jews. Is there any uh, threat of, of real anti-Semitism in America? No. 
Are you kidding? Well, I mean, uh, uh, 54%, 54% of American Jewish young people on university campuses in the past year witnessed firsthand or experienced anti-Semitism. To me, that's alarming. The ADL just published reports that attacks went up 14% recently, I don't remember, I think in the past year. So, of course, there's anti-Semitism here. And, I, and again, I think that the, the, the engagement of people who want to exterminate Jews, the engagement of people that think that I emanate from the urine of a donkey, is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And it should not, we should not tolerate that. That the P5 plus one and the United States and other Western governments are engaging the Muslim Brotherhood and the Iranian Revolutionary Regime and they think that human beings, in this case Jewish people, emanate from pigs and monkeys and the urine of donkeys and they want to exterminate us. That should give us pause. That should give us pause to reflect, you know, to ask ourselves, is that anti-Semitism? Is that anti-Semitism? And I know full well, I know full well that when I was active in the anti-apartheid movement, that if the Canadian government or Canadian corporations like Alcan and other companies, Shell and Western governments were engaging the apartheid regime, which subjugated people and treated African Ameri sorry, Africans, black Africans, black South Africans, as subhuman. That that was racism. That was racism. And I couldn't imagine negotiating with the apartheid regime for peace inside South Africa and not mentioning racism. Racism was a core element of the negotiations to end the apartheid system. So how could we negotiate for a freeze of uh, nuclear weapons designed to annihilate Jews and not talk about anti-Semitism. And to say it in many circles in this city and in this country is a problem. To, to, to raise the issue is a problem. And I think we have to ask ourselves, what is anti-Semitism today? And what does it mean to us? And what does it mean to people who care about democracy? impossible to think of Israel and peace, the, the two don't go together, but he's on record on many occasions as saying anti-Semitic things, which he's not being considered. He is the next person. Yes, and yes. millions of people look at him for news. They think he, uh, John Stewart, that is, yeah. is the news of the day. And they don't know that it's faux news and that it's uh, mockery and snark. And this is happening right now. And John Stewart, God knows, is bad enough. Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. But at least he's Jewish. This yeah. guy is even Jewish, and he's an obnoxious thing. All right, good, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.